You want to give me a fresh intro? Sure. I'm Rod Adams. I publish Atomic Insights, uh, host and produce the Atomic Show podcast. I've been doing Atomic Insights now for a little over 20 years. Uh, former naval officer, uh, submarine officer, chief engineer in a submarine, uh, involved with uh, finance in the, in the Navy, and then uh, got commercial experience working for Babcock and Wilcox Company. Why are nuclear reactors considered base load machines? When you build very large machines, you have a lot of uh, inertia. Um, so you have both thermal inertia, and then you have in the nuclear world uh, variations in uh, reactor power. Um, <clears throat> you have to design reactors to be responsive if you want them to be responsive. In the commercial world, they figured that they would make most money if they operate them in a steady state power level. So that was the way they were designed. Now in the Navy, we couldn't do that. So we had to design reactors that could respond to changes. And it's possible to do it. Uh, fission responds very quickly. There are a few things you have to worry about. You have to make sure you have enough excess reactivity to overcome xenon transients. Uh, and that's what the Navy does. They have make sure they have plenty of excess reactivity and they can respond very quickly, go from all stop to all head flank in a matter of a minute or two. A few of your podcasts have been on the subject of communications. Like mm -hmm. I kind of think like that's almost like the, the meta topic of your podcast is nuclear communications. What's your take on the industry's communication efforts? The industry has a philosophy of as long as nobody's thinking about us, that's a good thing. Uh, they like to do their job quietly and uh, hope for the best. Unfortunately, what that means is that when you have a crisis and you have to do crisis communications, nobody's ever heard from you. Nobody's ever thought about the good things you've been doing day in, day out, all of the benefits you've been providing to the community, all the economic impact, all the education, everything that's good that you do. If you don't talk about it, nobody thinks about it. So when there's an accident, or when there's an event, even not an accident, just an event that makes the news, you hear something bad. People say, well, you know, the, this reactor is unreliable because it was down last year. And then you look at the overall reliability and the plant's been up 95% of the time. Yeah, it had, it had a shutdown last year, but that made the newspapers, the other point never did. So that's, the, the industry's got to recognize that any industry has a right to tell its own story, has a responsibility to tell its own story. In some cases, the way an industry tells a story is to advertise, to buy advertising, to, to tell people, hey, look what all the good things we're doing. They take a, you know, a, a page from the oil companies, ConocoPhillips, they're a big oil producer and refiner, but they don't really even have retail gas stations. That doesn't mean they don't advertise. They go out and say, hey, we'll go out and we're, we're finding new energy, we're bringing new power. That's what you gotta do. Is it because the nuclear industry is too small and they can't afford it or something? Um, in many cases, th what is the current nuclear industry, which is plant operators, they're utility companies, they're uh, regulated as to what they can charge for electricity, and they're not allowed to add the cost of advertising into their rate base. So if they decide to advertise, they have to take it out of their profits. So generally speaking, they won't do it. Uh, they, and they also have the philosophy, well, people got to buy our electricity. They don't have another supplier, so why should we advertise? In the U.S., about the only advertising most utilities do is to tell people not to buy electricity. I mean, really, their advertising is all of their efficiency programs. You know, all of the, uh, the, they give people a subsidy to buy a more efficient refrigerator. So what's Westinghouse then? Like, why, why does it fall on the utilities to do that? Why doesn't Westinghouse do that? Um, Westinghouse uh, believes they, they have a, uh, an understanding of what, who their customers are and what they need, and they don't feel like they need to advertise to the public. If most people didn't really pay attention to it, but if they go back and look or review or were able to review tapes of the news coverage during the Fukushima frenzy, they would realize that there were a number of clean natural gas commercials running during that time. 
there were whole new campaigns built to teach people in the U.S. that we have a hundred years of natural gas right under our feet. We should go get that stuff. Pretty good time to advertise if you're a natural gas company. You know, when there's a big event in the nuclear world. Analog of that would be then uh, some, say a Westinghouse might want to advertise when there's a natural gas, natural gas pipeline breaking. Well, that would give them plenty of opportunities <laughs> to advertise. I mean, that happens almost routinely. I mean, uh, let's see, the, the last one I saw was just two days ago, a huge natural gas pipeline in Australia uh, had, a, had an explosion and uh, it's going to take out the supply of natural gas to uh, thousands of people for several weeks is what it said. Uh, the, you know, there's, there's pipeline, there was a couple of, a whole block of buildings in New York City that blew up not too long ago. Um, you know, there's oil trains that overturn. There's all kinds of opportunities to, to remind people that we have alternatives to fossil fuels. We have the ability to produce uh, safe, uh, easily delivered electricity from something that doesn't blow up. Nuclear power is already statistically safe per kilowatt hour. What does it even matter, communications-wise, to have a safer reactor? Um, it's not that it's safer. It's that it's as safe with a lot less effort. And effort translates into cost. Uh, the vast majority of the negative perception that, that Americans have about nuclear is not that it's unsafe. Uh, the polls show that if nuclear costs were under control, the public would be much more supportive. And politically speaking, it, there'd be much more support for nuclear. But everybody assumes that nuclear is expensive. And the industry itself, you know, reinforced that. Every time a new nuclear plant came online, when we were building them, the first thing the utility did was go to the rate commissioner and ask for rate increase to pay for their nuclear plant. It's that draw a direct correlation in people's minds. Nuclear equals more expensive electricity. And if there's already people questioning safety, why would we do it? You know, instead, it, people recognize there's nothing perfectly safe. But if the nuclear industry was able to come in and say, we're producing electricity cheaper, your bill's going down next month because we just brought this new plan online. Now, is that unrealistic? I think it's possible, it can be done, but you have to aim for that. Uh, we just saw a presentation today about the fact that the nuclear industry traditionally has no learning. In other words, there, there's no reduction in cost as we build more. But that's because we didn't try to reduce cost and we allowed those who don't like nuclear for various reasons to drive the cost up by changing the rules all the time. We couldn't standardize because the rules get changing. We couldn't even go from what we designed to what we built without the rules changing halfway in the middle. That's a very expensive way to build anything. Start one way and then redesign it, tear down walls that you already built. It's crazy. But we can do it. We just have to understand that there are people who oppose us. And it's not, excuse me, it's not the environmentalists. My message continues to be, you've got to know your enemy. And the nuclear industry doesn't recognize that uh, the, the competition are people that sell other energy sources. People have to make a choice. Do they want to buy nuclear or do they want to buy natural gas? Now the guys who sell natural gas want them to buy natural gas. There's no doubt. And that, that's something that, that most people in the industry just don't recognize. They don't see that there's purposeful opposition and that mostly it's driven by a desire to sell. Do you think that the industry should launch a effort to debunk people that are less credible on topics of nuclear? I think that when somebody makes false statements about nuclear, uh, that's when you need to address those statements specifically. And in some cases, you need to uh, demonstrate why the person who made the statement has no credibility. And don't give them the acknowledgement that they're an expert if they're not. 
if they have no basis for their expertise, if, there's a, if they're a guy who studied fusion in college and got a PhD, that doesn't make them an expert on nuclear energy. If they're a physicist, doesn't make them an expert on nuclear energy, particularly if they never have any experience in a power plant or operating anything. So, you know, the industry doesn't need to necessarily go on the attack, but when somebody is making false statements, we need to respond to the false statements and we need to explain why that person's opinion is not credible. You know, just because they can put in a, a bunch of uh, letters behind their name doesn't mean anything if they don't know anything. Uh, so for example, that uh, bit about her using the Australian Radiation Services debunked chart, right? I can't put it on there because no news organization has commented on it and Wikipedia only lets you uh, add facts if you can cite an actual news organization, not a lowly blogger such as myself <laughs> and probably not even you, Rod. Um, so it's like, um, it seems to me that the, the way that Helen Collicott gets away with this is all the way back to uh, no one, the industry not calling her out and saying that one thing you said there is not true because if the industry doesn't call her out on it and the media doesn't cover her in that fashion, I mean it's easy enough to blame the media, but if you're not calling her out on it, you don't really give them a story. Right. You, the media likes to tell stories. I mean, that, that's, although the media also likes to make sure their customers make a lot of money. Here, sit that down. And uh, so, yes, the, the media would have a little bit better opportunity to tell a good story if the industry was a little more uh, outgoing about recognizing when somebody's spreading misinformation. And when they, if they did that, you know, the back and forth would allow the media to, to quote the, the industry a little bit more. And, and sometimes it's not just about quoting, you know, we gotta, as advocates, we have to share our stories, share our contact information with the media and get on their Rolodexes have us be commenting, you know, why does Ed Lyman get quoted all the time? Because the answer is a phone.